Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship's uh, online worship. Um, as we continue our series, uh, today we're going to be looking into this familiar passage from Matthew 6, 24 to 34. Uh, and the sermon is titled, God's Provision for Anxious Times. And so, before we get into the text, here is a question I have for you. Have you been deeply anxious? Um, as you look at the world around you, uh, are you spiritually depressed? Uh, so today we are going to be looking into uh, another familiar passage which many of you know. And uh, so as we turn to Matthew 6, 24 to 34, uh, here are three insights that we are going to follow together again. Uh, number one. The idols beneath our anxiety. Number two, the values that define our security. Number three, the king who provides our ultimate security. Let me repeat that. The idols beneath our anxiety, uh, the values that define our security, and the king who provides our ultimate security. And so number one, the idols beneath our anxiety. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing. Now, uh, keep in mind, Jesus is speaking to the crowds who have been following him from Galilee, uh, the Decapolis region, uh, from Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Uh, we see that in chapter 4, 25. Uh, it was a mixed crowd uh, which included his disciples, right? And so here in verse 24, Jesus says to them, no one can serve two masters. He's getting to the very heart of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Uh, and so here's a question for you before we proceed further. Uh, what does your heart serve? Uh, see, the word serve means to obey, to submit. It means to be a slave in a negative sense. Uh, and so, see, everyone serves something, uh, if we are honest with ourselves, right? Um, and Jesus says here, whatever your heart serves, that is your master. Uh, and if you're familiar with the biblical passage, you remember when God gave the first commandment in Exodus 20, verse 3. Uh, what did he say there? Uh, there God said to his people, you know this, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And so notice the last part of verse 24 here says, Jesus says here, you cannot serve God and money. Uh, in other words, you will either worship God and serve the one true God, or you'll serve other mini-gods of your own making. And Jesus says, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Uh, notice the word love here, for instance. Uh, it means to regard with affection. It means to be affectionate, to give yourself affectionately to something. Uh, it's a language of the heart. And Jesus is saying, you cannot give your affection to God and give your affection to money at the same time. Uh, so, uh, here's a question. How can you tell if money has become your master? How can you tell if, uh, if you're serving money? How can you tell if your heart is serving money? Well, I can tell you, uh, you think about money all the time. <laughs> uh, this is why earlier in verse 21, Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart, your heart will be also. If money is your master, if money is your treasure, it will occupy your thoughts, your imaginations, and it will affect your emotions. 
Uh, see, the, the way you know that money is your functional master is that your anxiety level rises up and down based on the amount of money that is in your bank account. All right? And uh, let me be clear, in times of crisis like this, uh, there are legitimate needs and concerns. And some of you watching this have legitimate needs and concerns. And so my question to you is, how much is the anxiety? It's not that these legitimate concerns are, of, uh, are not, un are not uh, important. The, the question is, how much is your anxiety? Uh, that's the question, right? And the other way you know money has become your God, a sort of a false functional savior in your heart is you carefully hoard it. In other words, you, you're tight-fisted. Uh, if it's easier for you to save money than it is to give it away, you see, it may be that money has power over you, too much power over you. Uh, if it's overpowering your emotions, it means it has become your ultimate security, right? And so the, just the sheer fear of losing it ter is terrifying to you. Uh, it's causing this uh, restless anxiety within you. Do you see this here? This is very important. Uh, notice the key words here again, like serve, love, devoted. These are the languages he used here. Uh, it, it, it means these are deep-seated heart issues, right? Uh, the word devoted, for instance, it means to become one with something, to become one with money. You'll be either devoted to God, become one with Him, or be devoted to your money or your possessions or whatever it is that you love more than God. And Jesus says, see, no one can serve love and become one with two masters. Uh, it means God is either a, you're a master whom you love and serve, or money becomes your master whom you love and serve. And so here's a question, which do you love more? That's the question. Again, uh, the word money in verse 24 is in the Aramaic word uh, mammon. That's the Aramaic word for mammon. It means this, see, material possessions, uh, uh, wealth and riches, right? These are the things that speaks of the idols of our hearts. In other words, these are external things that are speaking of the idols of comforts deep within our hearts. And see, uh, also it is easy to read verse 24 and think that the only people who love money are those who gain money through fraud, through fraudulent means. Uh, but ask yourself this question if you're watching this today. Uh, what does your heart really serve? Uh, the religious answer obviously is, uh, I serve God. Uh, but elsewhere, uh, let me tell you, Luke 16, 14 says that the religious Pharisees were lovers of money. Uh, the Pharisees were very good at keeping outward religious appearances. Uh, but deep inside, deep down in their hearts, they were lovers of money, Luke says in Luke 16, 14. In other words, see, it is possible to be a deeply religious person and be a slave to money in your heart. Um, this is why Jesus said earlier in verse 2, When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the religious hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others, he says. The driving motive there for the religious Pharisees was to be praised by others. Everything was a show of religion. In other words, see, whether you're a religious person or not, and you're watching this, whether you're a CEO of your company or a manager of whatever position you may be having, Here's the thing, if you're using money to build up your own reputation, uh, the scripture says here that there's, there's the idols of power at work in your heart. You love your reputation more than you love God. That reputation is becoming a God thing in your heart. And see, Jesus is basically saying, money is a great servant, but a terrible master. Money is a ter uh, great servant, but a terrible master. Uh, if you idolize money, comfort and material wealth, see, you will eventually pierce your heart with deep-seated anxiety, uncontrollable anxiety. And so he says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. 
And obviously, let me say this, that Jesus is not talking about our clinical anxieties, right? He, he's, he's talking about the kind of anxiety that drives this nation, your nation, to restless exhaustion. It drives people to internal exhaustion in the rhythms of this city, right? Uh, and so, uh, what is it about life that makes us so anxious, I want to ask you. Uh, look at how he says right here, do not be anxious about your body and what you will put on. Uh, uh, it means without, the, uh, without feeling the body and covering the body, right? With clothes, we are vulnerable. We are prone to sickness and diseases. From the time that we were born into this world, we were born naked and we needed a covering. Our parents needed to cover us. Uh, the doctors and the nurses needed to cover us with clothing because it shows human fragility. It shows human brokenness and weakness that we are prone to get sickness and diseases very quickly and so uh, without these basic necessities surely we will die without clothing we, we, we couldn't stand the heat of the sun nor could we uh, stand the coldness of the weather of the winter nor the storms nor the rains right and so we we need this clothing these are essentials and without this it means we will die and see in other words, Jesus is saying this, that human life is fragile, exposed and vulnerable. From the time that we are born, we are dependent on someone else to clothe us. Therefore, Jesus says, is life not more than food? Isn't there something more to life than food and clothing? Jesus is basically saying, if you idolize the comfort that money and possessions bring, uh, you'll become a slave to it. If money, wealth, and material comfort becomes your master, if your heart uses it to derive your sense of value, it will lead to grave disappointments and it will pierce you in the end with darkness. He says, see, money cannot secure for you a happy future that only God can give you. And so next we see the values that define our security. The values that define our security, 26. Look at the birds of the air, Jesus says, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? <laughs> Verse 27, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. Verse 29, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, he was not clothed like one of these. Verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? See, Jesus says in verse 26, look at the birds of the air. Do you ever look out your window? Do you ever look out as you're st staying in your homes uh, throughout the week? Do you ever look out the window? Do you ever look up to the sky? Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. He shows his disciples how God sustains his creation. Uh, keep in mind, uh, these are the disciples who are going to be sent out on a worldwide mission at the end of chapter 28. Uh, these were the first disciples who left everything and followed him in chapter 4. And they would be depending on God for their needs as they go out to proclaim the gospel. In other words, see, it's very, very easy to look around, be distracted at the brokenness of everything and get anxious and depressed, right? And obviously the answer here is not uh, a stoic resilience. The answer is not stoic indifference to the sufferings of the world. Uh, but it's easy to look around and easy to forget to look up, to look up uh, at God's creation, the birds of the air, and the sun, the moon, and the stars, and how God has orchestrated everything so beautifully, and how he sustains this universe, and how he feeds the birds of the air. So, so here's a question. Where do you look every day? Uh, Jesus says, look up, uh, look at the birds of the air, how carefree they are. He says, they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. 
Uh, and so obviously, though the birds of the air uh, search for food, we know that God is the ultimate provider here, right? He says, look at how they soar on wings above the troubles of life. Uh, they neither sow nor reap nor gather, gather into barns anxiously like human beings do. When human beings gather into barns, they are anxious. They are working anxiously, Jesus is saying. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Uh, Jesus is saying here, look, look at the birds of the air and see what a caring heavenly father God really is. Uh, do you recognize God as a father? Look, God's economy is never affected by the human economy. It's not affected by any eco human economy. When our economy is in shambles and it's shaking, God's economy is unaffected. He's a sovereign provider here. And Jesus says, if God cares for his children, are you not of more value than they? That key word there is more value. <laughs> You're more valuable, he's saying. See, before we get deeper into that, money represents the value systems in our society. Money seems to be everything, isn't it? Uh, it represents obviously status. It represents power. It represents security. But if money defines your sense of word and security, see, it will lead to more and more anxiety and despair. Uh, you can save money for the future, but money cannot save you. You can save money for the future, but money cannot save you. Earlier in verse 9, Jesus said this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy. He says, moth and rust can destroy your treasures, whatever it is that you treasure more than God. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever values that define your security, right, moth and rust can destroy that, he says. And we are seeing this, all of you who are seeing this, and I say this with sympathy and with great respect, that in a time of COVID-19 crisis, very sadly, we are seeing that the idols of success, the false gods of industries, the false gods of finance, the false gods of education and entertainment, all of these things, even though they are blessings and good in and of themselves, when we make them into ultimate things, we see that they are crumbling and failing us. Uh, the false gods of economic power, if we trust in them, you see. And all of these things that we see in the world are either shaken right now, or they're being shut down, or they're crushing us, and they're failing to deliver what our hearts are longing for. And so if you treasure money, your career, even health, more than you treasure God, it will not only lead to more anxiety, uh, it will destroy you in the end, see? Mott and rust can destroy that. And here, Jesus says, do you not know how much more value God places on you? Uh, do you not know how much you are worth to God? Uh, this actually takes us back to Genesis 1.27, where, where uh, the scripture says, God created man in his own image to have intrinsic worth and value from him. In other words, you derive your value and your sense of word from God, not from possessions, not from accomplishments, not from achievements or created things. So, are you not more than the birds of the word more than the birds of the air? Are you not worth uh, more than the birds of the air that God feeds? <laughs> Are you not made in his image, deriving your sense of word and value from him? See, uh, Jesus says in verse 27, uh, we see here, he asks this very pinpointed question to shatter the illusions that we are in control, right? He says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour? <laughs> uh, let's let's uh, minimize that to a single minute to his span of life. Because the word hour here translates as cubit. Uh, it's a metaphor for length of time. And Jesus is saying, which of you, by being anxious in your heart, can control even one minute or even an hour in your life? It shows how futile our attempts to control the world are. See, beneath our worries are idols of control, right? In all of your plannings, right, uh, beneath your worries are idols of control. 
a desire to secure for ourselves a happy future that we don't believe God can provide, right? There is this desire, right? Deep down, uh, a desire to secure for ourselves a happy future that we don't believe God can provide. And so we try to maneuver our ways. Obviously, you should plan, but how much is your anxiety? It's Jesus is saying, even time, even time is in God's sovereign hands. So why are you anxious about clothing? Why are you anxious about your life? Jesus is saying. He says in verse 28, Why are you anxious about clothing, what you will wear? He mentions clothing again. Now, this is significant. Uh, do you remember how Adam and Eve uh, discovered their need for clothing in Genesis 3.21? Uh, see, deep down, everyone longs to be covered. All of you who are watching this longs to be covered in your deep sense of shame and insecurity, right? All these deep sense of insecurity and need for covering is because of sin, the brokenness of sin, the brokenness that sin has brought about. So Jesus says here, he takes your attention again, consider, he says, consider, ponder, think, reflect uh, the lilies of the field. <laughs> How they grow. Look at how they grow naturally. They neither toil nor they neither toil nor spin. Verse 29. And yet, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed. He was not clothed like one of these. Wow. This is breathtaking. Uh, in in 1 Kings uh, 10, 4, and 5, let's go there quickly. When the queen of Sheba saw the wealth of King Solomon there, it says there was no more breath in her. Incredible. It was breathtaking to see Solomon's clothing and wealth. It was breathtaking to see Solomon's wisdom and all of his courts and all of the clothing and the material wealth that surrounded him. Right? And it says that there was no more breath when the queen of uh, Sheba saw that. There was no more breath in her. It was awe-inspiring. It was just breathtaking to see uh, all of that uh, clothing and the royal robes of Solomon. But Jesus is saying here, Solomon's royal robes are no match for the beauty with which God clothes the lilies of the field. <laughs> Incredible. When you look at creation, when you look out your window and you see the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and the grasses, when you look at creation and see how God feeds the animals and clothes the flowers of the field, they are breathtaking. They captivate your imaginations. And But he's taking us further. Jesus says in verse 30, If God so clothes the grass, all of his creation, and he feeds them and he beautifies them, will he not much more? The key word there is, will he not much much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith. See, even though you're anxious with weak and little faith, will God not clothe you, Jesus says. Solomon's royal robes were great, right? The lilies of the field are greater. But in chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus says this, Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. I love that. Someone much greater than King Solomon has come. And so finally we see the king who provides our ultimate security. Verse 31. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows, all that, uh, knows that you need them all. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Notice how Jesus says in verse 30, 31, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? These are the murmurings of the heart. Why does he say this? Because verse 32, For the Gentiles, the nations, uh, seek after these things. 
and asked for you. He's saying, there is a heavenly father who knows that you need all of these things. You have a father who clothes the lilies of the fields and takes care of the birds of the air. And he, because you are more uh, valuable than them, look, he's saying that you have this father who knows all your needs. Uh, he knows your deepest needs. In other words, God who provides for the birds and clothes the lilies of the field has given you his kingdom. Because the picture here is his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom, he says. Only God's kingdom will last. So he says in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom, the kingdom of God, not your kingdom. Earlier in verse 29, he had already mentioned Solomon the king. Now he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Because greater than Solomon is here. Greater than Solomon's kingdom. Solomon's kingdom was ushering, pointing forward to the coming kingdom which has come through Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the king who has come to clothe us in our nakedness, in our sins, in our insecurity, in our frailty in our weaknesses, in our shame. Uh, this is why he says, seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, in which Jesus is the true and sovereign king. And seek his righteousness, he says. What does he mean? See, external clothings, no matter how beautiful, no matter how expensive, cannot cover our guilt. They cannot cover our internal sense of nakedness and insecurity that sin has brought about. See, the glories of clothing industries and fashion industries cannot clothe our spiritual nakedness. They cannot cover our deep sense of shame. No amount of accomplishments can cover our deep sense of shame. No amount of uh, exalting ourselves and creating for ourselves a uh, reputation can really, really cover that deep sense of shame. Even, even, if you, even if you climbed the corporate ladder and became a successful person, maybe you're watching this and you're a very successful person, and you know without a shadow of doubt that deep inside, you know that there is a sense of nakedness, a missing link between your accomplishments and the nakedness and the vulnerability and the need for internal clothing that is within you. That is there and that is why Jesus has come. He has come to, to clothe you in your nakedness and sense of shame and guilt. Uh, see, the glories of clothing industries cannot clothe this spiritual nakedness. They cannot ultimately prevent us from diseases and sin that are killing us. And there is a greater disease called sin that has been killing us for, uh, f for as long as uh, we have been on this earth. But Jesus here is the sovereign king who has come to seek and clothe us uh, much later. In chapter 27, it says this in verse 35, And when they had crucified him on the cross, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Notice that they divided his garments, his clothings. They stripped him of his clothings. Your king, verse 36, And they sat down and kept watch over him there. They wouldn't let him go. They were waiting for him to die. Verse 37, and over his head, they, this, was a, this was to mock him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King, the King of the Jews. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. On the cross, the greatest king of the universe was stripped of his garments and hung naked in, in, hung naked in shame for our sins. He was stripped of his clothes as a king. He was stripped of his royal robe which they covered him with so that he might be clothed, we might be clothed in his robe, right? We know that he didn't wear any fancy robe. It was to mock him. The crown was there to mock him, to mock him. And there he died in nakedness so that you and I might be clothed so that we men, you and I might be clothed with a royal robe of God's righteousness. He was shamed in nakedness that we might be forgiven and covered in His righteousness. We who have no righteousness before God have now been covered with the finest of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Else, elsewhere, Luke 15, 22 tells us, and I love this imagery. 
he tells us that when the prodigal son returned home, the father said this to him, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet ring on his hand put the best robe that is the royal robe with which we have been covered because of Jesus <clears throat> see when you come to Jesus he clothes you with his finest Jesus has purchased eternal treasures for you if you're watching this today whether you're poor whether you're spiritually poor or not see Jesus has purchased eternal treasures for you he died to make you his royal treasure let me say that again Jesus died to make you his royal treasure so we see in verse 38 Jesus is mocked as the king of the Jews he is the true and greater king in God's kingdom the greatest king Jesus became poor for your sake so that you by his poverty might become eternally rich Jesus is God's true and better provision, our ultimate security for all times, in troubled times, in anxious times, in times of need, even in times of abundance. He's always our true and better provision, our ultimate security. And so back to our verse here, Jesus says, if we seek after our mini kingdoms and make ourselves the kings and rulers, they will become the source of our anxiety in the end. Therefore, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, because the true king has come. He has come to seek you even when you had no desire or strength to seek him. Today, if you're watching this and have no strength to seek him whatsoever, he has come to seek you. He has come to save you. Isn't that a good news? Come to him today. If you're new to Christianity and you're not a believer, give your life to Christ because he has called you to his scriptures today. See, when the additional things that we seek after here in verse 33 become the ultimate things, they become a burden too heavy for us to carry. They are the very source of our anxiety. But here's the good news. Jesus is the true king who has come to carry the sins and the idols that are crushing us. He says, seek first God's kingdom above your selfish interests. Worship and serve the true king who has come to give his all for you. And all these things shall be added to you. And in verse 34, we close with this. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. See, if God has provided his son for you and gives you your eternal security, you need not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Worrying about tomorrow will rob you of your peace and strength today. Worrying about tomorrow robs you of your inner peace that Jesus gives you today. Christ is enough for you. He's enough for you today and he's enough for you tomorrow. <laughs> See, you can save money f t uh, for tomorrow. It's wise to save. But money cannot save you from tomorrow's troubles. And there will be troubles, Jesus says. Sufficient for today is its troubles. Tomorrow will have its own troubles. But Christ will be enough for you. He will be the source of your strength and peace and joy and lasting joy, right? Uh, only if Jesus is your king and master can he give you peace today and tomorrow. He will be a source of strength for tomorrow's trouble. You will be able to handle tomorrow's troubles because of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. If the richest king gave up his all for you on the cross, will he not load you and feed you? Uh, if God clothes you with the best garment, with the righteousness of his son, will he also not provide all that you need tomorrow? <laughs> it means you can trust him. If he has provided your eternal needs, your eternal need, not tomorrow's needs, uh, the needs that will last for all of eternity, the eternal inheritance and the riches that he has purchased for you and provided for you, will he not graciously give you your temporal <laughs> needs? For, so trust him. This, this makes me joyful. See, don't let the regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow rob you of your peace today. It is right to save for your future. But when you do that, I want to encourage you, plan your life 
with God's kingdom in mind. If you haven't done that, your dreams are too small until they line up with God's wider kingdom. Your dreams are just too small until they line up with God's kingdom. So plan your life accordingly. Line up with God's kingdom. Your dreams are just too small until they line up with God's kingdom on this earth. And so his kingdom will have no end. And one day his kingdom will come in full. So let's give priority together as a church to God's kingdom and bring all of our time, our resources and energy and and energy under his kingship sufficient for today is its own troubles for tomorrow's troubles god's gracious provision will be sufficient for you jesus is enough for you today and he will surely be enough for you tomorrow so let me close us in prayer father thank you so much for the joy the joys of salvation I thank you for all who are watching this and are worshiping with us today, that you would give them your everlasting peace. Thank you for the assurance that you have given us the very best when you gave us your Son, that we were vulnerable, we still are, but you have clothed us with the righteousness of your Son that he took the righteous judgment that was coming upon us and because he took the judgment for us we have been clothed with his righteousness you have made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him in jesus christ we might become the righteousness of god when the prodigal son returned home you said bring the best robe and put the ring and uh, on his fingers and shoes on his feet thank you for uh, dying for us jesus to make us your royal treasure for all of eternity and because of the because of this and because of the great work you have done for us we we too can call you our treasure our lord our sovereign god and king and you will surely provide your people with all of their needs according to your riches not according to the economy or that is fluctuating around us but but according to your economy according to your eternal riches which you have purchased for them on the cross so provide the needs of those who are watching perhaps people have lost their jobs comfort them and those who are uh, in fear of losing their jobs and also those who have made uh, their jobs or their careers or their uh, treasures, their early treasures, their ultimate treasures, God, I pray that you would deliver them and rescue them and show them how they are living in spiritual poverty by doing that and bring them the peace and the joy that only the true gospel of your son can bring them. I pray, Father, these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen.